<clears throat> okay, well, um, we're continuing in our Roman series, um, and another interlude, okay, and basically, um, as you know in the, in the past, uh, I've stayed away from the subject of election and predestination, um, you know, in the, um, when we were in Romans chapter 9, I focused primarily on the purpose of election as stated in Romans chapter 9, but now the Lord, I think, is kind of impressed on me that it, it's time to look at this issue a little bit uh, deeper. Uh, this is uh, part one um, of at least two parts, maybe three. And as you know, my position in the past has been to focus on justification, a subject that Christians are by and large pretty ignorant of. And justification, for lack of a better term, in the Bible is very uh, mathematical uh, in nature. Um, you know, definitive, in other words, rather, and, and, you know, election, not so much. So my theory has always been is focus on what you can know definitively and then let the Lord use that to show you uh, whatever He wants to show you in regard to more difficult truths, okay? And I think that's worked out well for me. Certainly I have a, a clear um, uh, understanding of predestination in the Bible than I've ever had before. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to go on a journey here and uh, look at this issue. Very closely coincides with the Book of Romans and uh, justification. So we're staying with our theme. Think about this as a, as we learn more and more in the book of Romans, think about this as kind of a revisiting of chapter 9. Okay? And looking at, uh, and I, I think the approach that we've taken in the book of Romans is, you know, if, if we don't know something for certain, move on. Okay? And then we've kind of been going back as we learn more when we're more sure of what the Bible is saying about these things. Everyone must agree uh, the doctrine of predestination came from the big three of the Reformation. And um, again, yes, I'm talking about Protestantism, uh, the Reformation teachers, so on and so forth, because that's the prism that everyone in our Western culture sees the Bible through. All right? And... Um, so again, uh, uh, the big three of the Reformation is Augustine, Luther, and Calvin. The doctrine is Augustinian, all right, and Luther and Calvin systematized and articulated it for the Reformation. From my standpoint, after writing 1,500 articles and four books on the Reformation, the reformers were not biblically right about anything. I, I hate to say that, but you know the the truth remains is that the Augustine, Augustine, um, who er, everybody knows that Luther and Calvin were greatly influenced by him. Augustine clearly uh, looked at the Bible allegorically, all right, and was was greatly influenced. Uh, by Plato. Um, so, at any rate, um, Luther and Calvin systematized uh, and articulated uh, Augustinian doctrine for the Reformation. In regard to what we've looked at in the past in Protestant tradition, and I say that, you know, in, in my assessment, uh, they were right about very little, if anything. Um, were they right about predestination? 
That is the idea that God selected or predetermined some for salvation and not others. The idea that man has no will or ability to seek God or flee to Him for salvation. Salvation is a total work of God or what we call uh, monergistic, a monergistic work or monergism. The idea that man co-labors and works with God uh, is synergism. Okay, those are both theological terms. Um, this poses some logical problems and also makes Christianity akin to Hinduism. And you can uh, see the notation there. And Islam, which are also heavy, heavily predicated on the idea of predestination. But predestination should not be rejected for those reasons alone. Okay? Uh, logically, one is perplexed by the idea that God judges people for not choosing Him when they have no ability to do so. Okay? Logically, one wonders why the prophets of God exhorted men with tears to repent when some have no ability to do so. Okay? The idea of predestination throws the Bible into confusion for many reasons. For one, God on the one hand states, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sons are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Why would God interject reason into the process when men are unable to reason? One of the favorite Bible passages among the Reformed is the resurrection of Lazarus. See, they say, he was dead. He could do nothing. He couldn't make a choice. He came to life by God's calling alone. Very well. If all men are like Lazarus, why would you reason with dead people? And this was exactly Luther's reasoning, for lack of a better term. Uh, Luther uh, despised the idea that man could reason. All right? And this gets back to very Platonistic ideas about the average man not being able to interpret his own reality. Okay? Um, so, um, yes, thank you. Furthermore, Lazarus was already a believer. So really, what's the point in making that analogy? Making this resurrection a statement about justification is really sloppy hermeneutics at best. So let me be clear. Uh, I am speaking to the problem of confusion here and not trying to refute uh, predestination with pure logic. I think that's a bad idea to approach the Bible with pure logic. Um, there is some faith involved. Okay, uh, man is not the end of of everything. Okay, there are some mysteries about God, uh, but clearly the confusion of it uh, all is very problematic for Christians. And let's face it, especially in regard to evangelism, it's paralyzing. Who does not recognize the difficulty in getting people to evangelize in Christian circles? Clearly, the incentive is lacking. The God is going to do what He is going to do mindset, kind of a Sarah Sarah mindset, is pervasive in both categories of Christian living and evangelism. And how that comes out in Christian living is Christians always want to what about everything? Pray about everything. Okay? Um, you know... We pray about everything, and if God's going to do something, He's going to do something, and if He isn't, He isn't. Uh, this is pervasive in, in Christianity. The short answer for all of this via the Reformed camp follows. Um, and this is where we, I think, the Lord has led me to believe that we've got to come to uh, grips with this. Um, 
is is because the the reformed or Protestant idea of what predestination is, okay, um, uh, is, is has a profound uh, impact on how Christians function, okay. Um, Their short answer follows. We evangelize because it illustrates that choice is all of God, and therefore God is glorified when men repent, and God is equally glorified when men refuse to come to Him. Um, if God saved everybody, the riches of His grace would not be known. It would be taken for granted, which would rob God of glory. And in fact, there seems to be biblical precedent for this. And Susan, why don't you read uh, the passage in Romans there? Okay, Romans 9, 6 and following. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended <clears throat> from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, <coughs> that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me this way? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for de destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Okay, so um, seems, uh, seems pretty clear now. Okay. Uh, instead of breaking now, instead of breaking down the context in the, of this, in order to refute the belief that this passage bolsters the idea that God is uh, uh, predestined who will be saved and not saved, let me jettison to another aspect of election, the subject of of uh, what we have just read. Uh, but before I do, I think something needs to be. Uh, said about the Apostle Paul. In fact, the Apostle Peter said it. All right. And um, uh, Susan, why don't you read 2 Peter 3:11 and following for me? Okay. 2 Peter 3:11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Alright, so by the way, it's very likely that these are the last words that Peter wrote to the Assemblies of Christ, and he knew that they were his last words. You can see that in uh, 2 Peter 1, 12-13. This gives it a very... Uh, eerie tone uh, to his amen at the end of this letter. When he said amen, uh, I mean, according to what he wrote in this same letter, he knew that this was his last written words to the church. Think about that. It's, it's a short book, and I would recommend it as a bedtime or lunchtime uh, devotional for, uh, for anybody uh, to read that letter through with this in mind. These are the last thoughts that Peter deemed most important for the assemblies to remember. But the point I want to make is what, Paul, uh, what Peter said about Paul. I think Peter is being very gracious here, as I will confess that Paul is uh, by far the apostle I look to or look up to uh, most. But he can also be very annoying. And why is that? Paul wrote in a way that demands thinking. And I think a lot of times we don't want to think. Okay? Um, in regard to making things simple for the simple, he really had no mercy. I mean, if you read a lot of what Paul you know, wrote, when I'm studying and try to preparing for these lessons, and I, I read some of the things Paul wrote, it's like, you know, really? <laughs> What do you make of that? You know, Galatians 2.20, you know, passages like that, what do you make of them? When pastors talk about, quote, keeping the cookies on the bottom shelf, you can be sure that they have never met Paul. I know many beloved brothers and fellows, fellow teachers of the Word who are also often annoyed by Paul, uh, and I feel their pain. But yet, the last three years of my Christian life are pretty much about Paul. Please take note of this. Calvinists want to debate me on all of the Bible verses that seem to indicate salvific predestination, and there are many. But they don't want to debate me on what Paul specifically wrote on justification. Paul is the Achilles heel for Calvinism, and really Protestantism in general, even though they, they claim them. I have been turned down in regard to public debate by two respected Calvinists on this wise. They dare not get into a discussion of Pauline law and gospel. They are absolutely dead in the water on this issue. So what I'm saying here is, is um, in the debate of predestination, people want to focus on the the numerous verses in the Bible that do seem to indicate this individual predestination by God where He chose some and didn't choose others for eternal salvation. Okay? But yet, in the, uh, uh, when you get right down to the core of justification and what this view of predestination uh, uh, insist that they believe on justification, many, many problems arise. The theological math doesn't add up. Um, but note what Peter said. Many take the difficulty of what Paul wrote and use it to twist the Scriptures. Okay? And in regard to predestination, 
I believe this is the very case. Now, back to where I'm going with this. It is easy to assert the idea that man has no choice and is elected. But what about the idea that Jesus Christ is elected? You know, what's that all about? And what I'm saying here is that we just can't take the verses that seem to indicate that God predestined some for salvation and others He didn't uh, because, now let's face it, that creates some very uh, logical um, stress, okay, uh, and tensions um, logically. So we've got to take all of Scripture, all right? We just can't gloss over the fact that the Bible says Jesus Christ was elected, all right? And we are talking about election. So in what context was Jesus Christ elected? Okay, Jesus Christ was in essence God. So, uh, Susan, why don't you read these passages uh, that refer to the fact that Jesus Christ was elected? 1 Peter 2.4 Or Isaiah 4, 20, uh, 42, 1 first. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 28.16 no, oh, it should I see. be. Oh, yeah. I I'm down at the bottom. I'm yeah. sorry. Isaiah 42, 1. Mm -hmm. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Okay, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ for it stands in scripture Isaiah 28 6 behold I am laying in Zion a stone a cornerstone chosen and precious and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame all right now the only way this makes sense, uh, besides the unfortunate renderings of these ideas by uh, religions like the Jehovah's Witnesses, I believe, that, that you know, take uh, the fact that Christ was elected to mean that he was also created, uh, which is, you know, obviously some serious heresy. Um, the only way this makes sense is if Christ um, and I was ever never able to make sense of this till I got involved in this study. The only way that this makes sense is if Christ is the chosen means of salvation, right? Does that make sense? In other words, the means of salvation are elected, but God's or but man still has the ability to choose the means. There is no salvation in any other name but Christ. Secondly, as a means of spreading the good news among the nations that God supplies a way to be reconciled to Him, He chose Israel as His nation to represent His name among the nations. So basically what we're looking at here is two purposes of election, or the, the means of the gospel or being reconciled to God. One is Christ, obviously, now this is obvious, but because of our distorted view of election and what we've been taught about election, i.e. God uh, chooses, predestined certain people to be saved and not saved before the foundation of the world, they have no choice in the matter. Uh, they're either elected or not elected. And then you come across in the Bible the fact that Jesus Christ was elected, and you say to yourself, wait a minute here. 
So does that mean God the Father chose Christ for salvation? Well, that couldn't be right. But now if we look at election as the means of, of God's gospel and the means from which God set forth for men being reconciled, now things start making sense, no? All right? Now, that's uh, means number one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at another means that God uses and elects, uh, and that is Israel. Okay? Um, let me see here. So, uh, the only way that that makes sense is if Christ was chosen means of salvation. Uh, there is no salvation in any other name but Christ. Secondly, as a means of spreading the good news among the nations that God supplies a way to be reconciled to Him, He chose Israel as His nation to represent His name among the nations. And if you could read Exodus 19.3 and Isaiah 8.8. 8. Exodus 19.3 and following. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Isaiah 8, 8 through 10. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took the end from the ends of the earth and called you from its furthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I've got a footnote there that lists several other verses that you can go to about Israel being God's elect. Uh, though all of Israel are Abraham's offspring, not all within Israel will be saved. Moving on to more purposes here of election. The lineage or offspring God chose was according to the miraculous promise, not the conniving of Abraham to help God out, which can be found in Genesis 15 and Galatians 4, uh, 21 there. God chose a certain lineage within the, the national kinsmen of Abraham from which Christ would come. In the case of Isaac and Ishmael, Isaac represented God's means. In the case of Jacob and Esau, Jacob was the chosen one to continue the lineage of promise that Christ would come out of. As we just read, God hated Esau and loved Jacob, before either did anything bad or good, or did he? Actually, Rebecca was told, quote, the older will serve the younger before either of them did, did bad or well. God later hated the descendants of Esau, that is Edom, for their austere wickedness. Did God appoint Edom to wickedness, or did he choose that Jacob to continue the lineage of promise based on what he foreknew. Uh, that passage in Romans 9 is often described as God hating Esau and loving Jacob before they were born. But that is not the case at all. Paul is merely saying that the Edomites were not the nation from which the promise would come. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the point that Paul was making in Romans 9 is that the promise was still through Israel even though God had temporarily turned back on Israel in favor of the Gentiles. Hence, um, but it is not as though, and this should be in quotations and it's not, 
Okay, that's an error I'll have to go back and fix. Hence, but it is not as though the Word of God failed, Paul said in Romans 9, where we just read, uh, for not all who are descendants from Israel being uh, belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham uh, because they are his offspring, but, quote, through Isaac shall your offspring uh, be named. This is not about individual predestination at all. This is about making it clear to the, to the Roman Gentiles, and Gentiles in general, that Israel is still God's chosen people, even though they rebelled against Him. And indeed, this is not a message that Gentiles have understood well, regardless of Paul turning himself into a pretzel to make the point in Romans 9 uh, through 11. Read these chapters for yourself. The election of Israel and its eventual salvation is the clear thesis. As Christ said, quote, salvation is of the Jews. God's plan of salvation involves uh, the election of Christ in Israel. And before we move on, let me make two additional quick points. Okay? Um, Paul wanted to make it clear to the Romans that Israel was still elected. I already said that. But again, we have a problem here. Alright? Um, from the standpoint of Protestantism, we have the clear doctrine uh, that was that of Calvin and Luther and Augustine of what? Supersessionism or uh, replacement theology. The idea that uh, the church, quote unquote, replaced Israel because Israel rebelled. Well, the whole point of Romans 9 through 11 is, is that is absolutely not the case that even though God had turned to the, the Gentiles to what? Make Israel jealous, they were still His chosen people. And Paul warned specifically in those three chapters to not boast against uh, the olive tree. Okay? Or boast, I'm sorry, boast against the branches. For if God can graft back in the natural, or if God can graft in uh, the unnatural branches to the tree, how much more will He engraft once again the natural branches? All right? Uh, Paul sternly warns the Roman Gentiles to not boast against the branches. Well, okay. Uh, that all happened in Rome, and as we eventually know in church history, that was the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church from there after the departure of uh, Peter and Paul, and that's exactly what they did, okay, uh, with these doctrines of supersessionism and replacement theology. God's plan of salvation involves the election of Christ in Israel. I am not going to take room here to expand further on this point, but let me also add that God elected apostleship, okay? That is the ministry of the twelve apostles. So when we have Christ saying, okay, when we have Christ saying uh, to the apostles, um, I, you did not choose me, I chose you. Uh, what, is he, what he is talking about there is their apostleship, and really that's not a scripture uh, that should be used to make the case of individual election. So get the apostleship, and our gifts are elected. Okay? Um, these are things mankind has no control over. You don't have any control over the gift God gives you. No? Yes? <laughs> okay? The apostles did choose to be apostles. They didn't go to God before the foundation of the world and say, God, I've got a great idea. Let's set up, you know, in your plan of salvation, let's set up this apostleship thing and we'll be one, you know, we'll be the twelve. 
All right, all of these things are obviously elected and, and designed by God before the foundation of the world in his foreknowledge. In John 3, of course the spirit is like a blowing wind that, has, uh, that man has no control over. Of course man has no control over the Holy Spirit's role in salvation. But can mankind choose to believe the truth about those works? I think he can. Um, you know, and they make a big deal out of this. What, 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 what Christ said to Nicodemus in John 3, the Spirit goes, you know, goes where he will, he does what he will. It's like the wind blowing, man has no control. See, man has no control over his new birth. Well, of course he doesn't. Man can't call down the Holy Spirit and birth himself spiritually uh, by commanding the Holy Spirit. Of course the new birth is out of man's control. But can man choose the means God has explained to him? I think he can. Before I move on to why I think this is the case from a biblical perspective, let me mention a few uh, of God's purposes for election. First and foremost, God's purpose election, of election is to completely eradicate works from justification. Um, and, okay, that's pretty much where we parked in um, uh, Romans 9, the first time we were there. Paul said, Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue not because of works, but because of him and call, that called. So, God wanted to continue the work of election, or the process of election. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, the process started with Abraham, uh, and, the, and the election, or the decision to make Abraham a great nation. Then from there, it was Isaac, over Ishmael, right? Um, so when Rebecca became pregnant with the twins, okay, uh, God continued that process by uh, electing Jacob uh, and his lineage that Christ would come out of as opposed to Esau. All right? Uh, so let's pause here for a moment. Uh, to think about something, all right? And you might say, well, you know, but, but God chose Jacob over Esau. Well, yes, but, is, but it, you know, how do you separate what God knew about those two people, all right, uh, versus uh, why he chose to do that, okay? Uh, for one thing, Esau, again, reiterating, would be, you know, the descendants that would come out of Esau would be the Edomites. Clearly, God did not choose to, to have Christ's lineage come out of the Edomites, but rather Israel. So, let's pause here for a moment to think about something. All right. Suppose God did elect certain individuals while condemning others. At least for the elect, they could be completely assured of their salvation because it was completely determined by God before the foundation of the world. How can you mess up something that was determined by God umpteen years before you were even born? Many, many biblical texts could be cited to give this positive note to the presumed reformed position on election. But here's the problem. Calvin believed that there are three forms of election, non-elect, temporary elect, and truly elect. All right? And therefore, assurance of salvation is not possible. You can see the note there, and if you go down, you can look at the direct quotation by Calvin on that. Of course, this defies the very purpose of writing 1 John as stated by John himself, in John uh, 5.13. Because the Reformation is the primary commenta commentary on the subject of election, the subject must be thoroughly revisited uh, with uh, stringent biblical um, evaluation. 
Okay, so what am I saying here? Well, I think the assumption is is that that well, you know, if you're elected, it's a done deal, right? But not according to the reformers. Actually, if you read the footnote at the end, what you will find is is that again there were the non-elect, there were three classes of threefold election. The non-elect, uh, the temporary elect, and the final elect. This is eerily similar to the to uh, the Hindu three classes of, like I said, Hinduism is predicated on predestination. They're uh, actually uh, Mom asked earlier about uh, about uh, re reincarnation. That's their afterlife doctrine. But karma, what you'll find in those notes, karma is interesting. Okay, because in the Hindu faith, karma is the belief that you're responsible for your actions and uh, the belief in cause and effect, i.e. You've got some control over your life, i.e., um, uh, uh, choices, okay, that that determine your own destiny. Well, they actually believed that that karma was um, a stage of belief for the spiritually immature, okay. As Hindu believers mature they come to a complete 100 belief, a percent belief in predestination, i.e. nothing you do in your life is done by you. God does it all through you. Sound familiar? Okay. So, um, here's the problem that we have. All of this needs to be re, re uh, visited because a, um, a study of church history and the histories of the world western philosophy, so on and so forth, it boils down to this. Plato got this from the Hindus, okay? Augustine got it from Plato, and Luther and Calvin got it from Augustine, okay? So, you know, how much is the Hindu idea of predestination integrated in today's Christianity, and is that good or bad? I present to you that it's probably not good. <laughs> okay, so we need to take a careful look, and that's why we're having this study. Now, let's look at another purpose of election in regard to Israel, if you can read uh, Deuteronomy 7.7. 7. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you, and in keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. All right. God chose Israel to demonstrate His power, promises, and protection through one of the smallest nations, if not the smallest nation, in the world. Listen, it makes no sense at all that, that a nation Israel's size could survive in the midst of so many formidable enemies, right? This is a miracle of God the, in our present day. This is the very manifestation in our day of God's future promises for Israel. Okay? God shows the low... Okay, then we look at more f further promises of God in election. God shows the lower classes of people in the world to demonstrate His wisdom through Him. Could you read 1 Corinthians one twenty six? For consider your calling, brothers. Stop right there. Consider your what? Calling. Calling, okay. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. To that, as it is written, Jeremiah 9, 24, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. All right, a problem that James confronted in the assemblies as well was the inclination of Christians in that day to capitulate to the rich and powerful. Paul reminds them that God chose their class to confound the pride of the rich and powerful. So a capitulation to the upper class circumvents the purposes of God in that, in that aspect of election. Okay? This isn't saying that the rich and powerful cannot be saved, but it is uh, irrefutable that God chose the lowly in general by virtue of who he targeted in his ministry endeavors. A pattern of means and purposes in election is what uh, we see are de developing in our study. This doesn't exclude individual choice by any, any means, okay? And now we're going to be uh, uh, to uh, develop that, but here's, here's the thing. Predestination, for the most part, for the vast, vast most part in our day, is um uh is is taught to us by the academic elite of our day this makes no sense at all because in the whole subject of election and predestination in and of itself we learn that god primarily did not choose them to teach us these things Okay, does that make sense? Alright, so maybe we should say that thanks for bringing, us, bringing this to our attention, but we'll take it from here because you're not chosen. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, now I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, uh, proffering ignorance in Christianity, obviously. I just got done complaining about the Apostle Paul because he makes us think. All right? But, uh, in regard to uh, credentials uh, and, and academic elitism, this is a huge problem. And again, it's a problem that comes from Platonistic roots that your certificate and your pedigree comes from paying money to get uh, credentials, all right? And I've said it before and I'll say it again. There are many, many, many men in the pulpits of the institutional church today that are there because they bought their pedigree. They do not have the gift of teaching. They're, re they're regurgitators of Reformed Orthodoxy and have very few thoughts that are their own, okay? They're just regurgitating the traditional thoughts of others. So, let's begin to look at the individual. Um, and we're only going to develop this a little bit because it's going to be our second part next week. We're going to develop the, the individual ground level uh, in, the, in the milieu of life, okay? But, let's do a little primer, if, Susan, if you could read uh, Romans 1.18 following. Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For the invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So, they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, 
and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. All right, so furthermore, mankind is created with the works of the law written on hearts along with a conscience that administers that law by either excusing or uh, excusing us or accusing us. We've talked about this before, Romans 12, or 2, 12 and following. For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law, that is the formal written Bible. They show that, listen, the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their consciences also bear witness in their conflicting thoughts either accuse or excuse them on that uh, day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. So, right back to Romans 1.32. Though they knew God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Okay? Man knows God, and he knows right from wrong. Remember, we talked about that. Uh, the Nuremberg Trials, for example. Um, you know, uh, who's to say what Nazi Germany did was right? Or what law book, or law canon, or law standard did the Nuremberg Trials uh, use? Well... The law that they used was actually the collective conscience of man, as he has the works of the law and a conscience created in every man born into the world. That's the law that they used. That's what Paul's talking about. Man knows God and knows right from wrong. He deliberately, listen, he deliberately suppresses the truth and unrighteousness Man is judged by God with a giving over to more enslavement to sin. That's what Paul said. This is a clear progression throughout the Bible. Even though God rose up Pharaoh to display his power and love for Israel, Pharaoh initially hardened his own heart, and that resulted in God further hardening uh, the heart of Pharaoh. Now, uh, the, this is seen in, in Exodus 7, and I've got a long list of uh, verses there out of uh, uh, Exodus where God predicted Pharaoh would do this, because God knows the future, but God would bring a plague, Pharaoh would repent, but then when God relented from that judgment, Pharaoh would harden his heart. And then eventually... God hardened Pharaoh's heart, all right, as a judgment. And then if you look at Exodus 14, 7, God hardened all of the hearts uh, of the Egyptians. Up until this time, the Egyptians are saying, Pharaoh, can't you see? We're going to be destroyed, okay? Um, and they couldn't talk any sense into Pharaoh. He kept hardening, and hardening his hearts. They kept following Pharaoh. Well, guess what? Eventually, the Egyptians, all the people who were following Pharaoh, their hearts were hardened. Okay? That's a great study. All the verses are right there if you want to read those chapters. I don't believe God hardened Pharaoh's heart against Pharaoh's own will. I believe God made use of what he knew Pharaoh was going to do and made Pharaoh more resolute in that or in it via judgment. The Hebrew writer, listen, the Hebrews writer implored the people to not what? Harden their hearts. Hebrews 3.8. 
Clearly, man's decision to not obey God and his gospel is a well-informed decision that he can understand, right? Didn't Paul just get done saying that in those uh, verses that we read in Romans? But ultimately, will man always refuse to come to God unless God intervenes? Is his will in bondage unless God chooses to break that will? As mentioned earlier, the traditional Protestant view of predestination must be rejected because it is the fruit from the poisonous tree. The laity must seek out a biblical understanding of predestination because after all, election is in the Bible and is a biblical word. We are compelled to do this because it is our calling as the lowly of the world and we are in darkness because we have capitulated to the ap academic elite. We have, <clears throat> we have looked at some of the big picture aspects of election and next week we will bring this down to a more individual level. We will examine, we will examine several verses in light of the big picture that do in fact seem to indicate that individual salvific fate is predetermined. We will also look at several verses that contradict that idea, and Lord willing, we will see the balance and the truth in it. But let me close with an, with an important note uh, on individual gospel appeal. One of the elements of Protestant predestination is the idea that Christ only died for, for those God pre-selected. This is known as limited atonement. My concern is that this doctrine greatly dampens the gospel plea of Hebrews 10. The idea there is that the spirit of grace will be outraged if such a great salvation is neglected. That's in Hebrews 2.3. This indicates that Christ did die a horrible death in order to offer salvation to all people. Hebrews 10 paints a terrifying pictures, picture of those who reject the salvation offer secured for them. Certainly, even if individuals are predetermined, we would be contradicting the apostolic office if we downplayed the terror of neglecting uh, this salvation offered to all. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is, is that if there's limited atonement, Okay, um, if there's limited atonement and this great salvation that involves Christ dying for them on the cross is rejected, that makes it a much severer condemnation than if this salvation wasn't for them in the first place. No? Okay, but this is the picture that the Hebrew writer is painting in Hebrews 10. This terrifying picture of rejecting uh, this sacrifice that Christ made for all men. Okay? Here's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.11. <laughs> Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, actually the word there is terror of the Lord, by the way, we persuade others. Okay, so should we conclude from that that men should, can be persuaded? I think obviously uh, they can, and there's a heck of a head start, right? Because the knowledge of God is written on their heart from b birth. The knowledge of God is intuitive, all right? So am I saying that there's no such thing as an atheist? No, I'm saying that that's what the Bible says, okay? But, but they say that they're atheists and they don't believe in God. Well the, well, the Bible also says that they deliberately suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It's a deliberate, willful rejection of reality. Okay? Um, next week, we continue this journey and we invite you to come with us. Okay? The Potter's House. So... Are there any questions?